How's it going guys? I'm an avid herpetologist. Welcome back to the channel. We're going to be doing another deck profile today. Specifically, we're going to be looking at a Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel deck profile. Now, this is a deck that I have had built in the TCG for a little while, but this archetype, the Godi archetype, was recently released onto Master Duel, and I've been kind of playing with different lists before finally settling on one that I was willing to make a deck profile for. This is a very fun, very unique deck, and before we get into the actual deck profile, I want to talk a little bit about the actual archetype itself because it's actually a bit of a pun. You see, the Godi archetype is actually supposed to be pronounced fish. This is an archetype composed exclusively of fish monsters, but the term Godi is actually kind of a way of poking fun at the English language and how hard the rules can be to comprehend. You see, we're going to be taking the GH in our phrase from the word tough. We're going to be taking the O from the word women, and we're going to be taking the TI from the word nation. So GH making our F sound, we have our O from women being our I, and finally TI giving us the SH sound from the word nation. So Godi actually supposed to be pronounced as fish. It's a bit of a dad joke. Now every member of the archetype is also going to be an anagram for various themes involved around space or fish themselves. The archetype is honestly very stunning to look at. It's absolutely gorgeous artwork, but each of the names, starting with Pacey's and Enoch, the first two to be released, being anagrams for, of course, space and ocean, while all of the other members of the archetype have names that are actually anagrams of fish, either in English or in other languages, which I think, again, is pretty cool. Now, the Godi archetype is fundamentally a synchro archetype, but unlike most synchro archetypes, which are looking to synchro summon on your own turn, which this deck is capable of doing, the big gimmick with Godi is being able to synchro summon on the opponent's turn. Not only are they a synchro archetype, they're also an archetype that revolves around banishing cards, either ours or the opponent's. So it's really a neat archetype. It actually has some pretty decent teeth as long as it has the right tools behind it. So let's go ahead and get into the deck profile and talk about those teeth right now. To begin with, let's go ahead and go over our hand traps because, of course, any deck in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! needs to be running hand traps. So getting into our hand traps, we are playing a single copy of Effect Veiler. We're playing our mandatory three copies of Max C, a three copies of our Ash Blossom. We're also going to be playing two copies of Nibiru, two copies of Called by the Grave, and, of course, a single copy allowed of Crossout Designator. Now, most of this probably doesn't need any explanation. Um, Nibiru is kind of nice as far as hand traps go in this deck in particular because it is not uncommon for some of our plays to leave our board empty, which means if our opponent is able to keep playing through our first initial interactions, we can then Nibiru whatever they were able to do after that. So Nibiru is kind of an extra nice card in this particular list, but let's go ahead and get right into the list itself. We'll start by talking about the members of the Godi archetype. The most important member, debatably, is going to be Pacey's Light of the Godi. You can banish this card you control to special summon any fish monster from your hand except for Pacey's. During the standby phase of the next turn, after this card was banished, you can then special summon this banished card. During your opponent's main phase, if this card was special summoned during this turn, you can, quick effect, immediately after this effect resolves, synchro summon a fish synchro monster using this card you control, and of course it is a hard once per turn. So this is going to be an effect that both of our primary tuners are going to share, both Pacey's and Schiff. But Pacey's in particular is nice because of that setup effect. So Pacey's is going to give us the option of summoning, as I mentioned, any fish monster from our hand. Which is why, in my particular list, I am choosing to play the explosive, super cool, super ancient Deep Sea King, Coelacanth. Now we're going to dedicate an entire section to talking about Coelacanth and his combo lines later on in the video. So if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and skip ahead towards that. We're also playing two copies of Schiff. Shift lets you banish it from the graveyard to target a fish monster you control and have it gain 500 attack until the end of the turn. During the standby phase of the next turn, just like Pacey's, you can summon it if it was banished. And then during your opponent's main phase, again, just like Pacey's, if this card was summoned this turn, you can immediately after the effect resolve, synchro summon a fish monster. Um, these two are going to be the primary combo line that we're going to be able to use. If we have both Pacey's and Shift in our banished zone in a level 4 in play, we will already be able to climb all the way up into a level 10 synchro monster. And we have quite a few good ones to choose from, but if we are specifically talking about the uses of our goaties, there's really only one level 10 synchro that we're interested in going into, and that is, of course, Godi of the Deep Beyond, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the last Godi tuner that we're going to be talking about is Zep, the Ruby of the Godi. So this card is slightly different from the other two. You can banish this card from your hand and then target a fish monster in your graveyard and banish it. During your opponent's turn, if this card is banished, meaning it is has currently been banished, 
you can then special summon this card directly to the field. If this card is special summoned, you can, except during the damage step, immediately after the effect resolves, synchro summon a fish synchro monster. So this is not going to be a tuner that is going to sit on the field and be able to activate its effect. Rather, when this card is banished, it will immediately summon itself. When it is summoned, it must immediately be used as a synchro material or you lose the effect. So it's slightly different, but this is still a card that fits very cleanly into our ladder that we're going to be climbing on the opponent's turn. And again, we're going to be spending some time talking about the full goatee combo lines once we get to the end of the video, so I'll have a little section for that as well. We do have a couple of other goatee cards to talk about, though. One of them that we're playing a single copy of is Ixeep, Omen of the Goatee. If a fish monster is banished, except during the damage step, you can special summon this card from your hand. During the standby phase of the next turn after this card was banished, you can target a goatee trap that is banished or in your graveyard and set it. We are not playing any of the goatee traps, so you don't need to worry about that. Basically, you just need to know that this card is essentially a free summon as long as you have banished something. It is mostly being played as a one-up because it combos very well with the single copy of the field spell that we're playing. So it's there for that, and again, it can be used as a nice ladder climb or potentially Xyz material, depending on what else you have in your hand. The last Goaty card in our main deck is going to be Snopios, Shade of the Goaty. This is actually really cool. He's one of my favorite Goaty cards, and he's kind of a pseudo hand trap. So Snopios has a during the main phase quick effect to banish two fish monsters from your hand and or graveyard to special summon him from your hand. If this card is special summoned, you can target a face up card on the field. That card would be banished when it leaves the field. If this card is banished, you can banish a fish monster from your graveyard and add this card to your hand. All of the effects, of course, once again, hard once per turns. Snopios is cool because against certain archetypes, using, for instance, Tier Laments as a great example, Snopios is able to target some of their key pieces and make sure they banish instead of going to the graveyard. This matters because you are cutting them off from potentially extending their plays by not getting their send to graveyard effects. However, if you are not playing a deck that is using these graveyard effects, Snopios' primary use, he's going to summon himself and target himself. He is a level 6 body, which means he is easily going to be able to take us up into our level 8 synchro, since we are going to be playing, of course, plenty of our level 2 goatee tuners. And in particular, if you were to banish Zep with his effect, he will immediately let you go into a level 8 as soon as Zep is banished, because he will summon himself, and then you can sync both of those two bodies off and go into an 8 instantly, which is really, really nice. Um, so Snopios is a very cool card. It's great as an extra extender. It's great as a hand trap. It's also a 2100 body, which is by itself a pretty reasonable attacker if you need one. So Snopios is very cool. Definitely worth playing. Now, the other startup card that we are playing that is still in a, kind of the goatee fish archetype is going to be three copies of Lifeless Leafish. Now, Leafish is pretty cool because it's kind of a one card startup that can at the very least get us to our level eights without needing any other setup. When this card is summoned, you can send a fish monster from your deck to the graveyard, except Lifeless Leafish, and you can banish it from your graveyard to target three fish monsters in your graveyard to shuffle them back into the deck and draw a card. Again, hard ones per turns. So Lifeless Leafish, the primary target you're going to want to send most of the time is going to be Shift. Banishing Shift to target the Leafish, you have already set up Shift to summon itself on the next turn, which can take you into our level 6, which is the start of our combo. So that is a very basic way to go for, into our combo that can potentially climb us into an 8 without any other setup that's just off of our level 4. Summon, um, sending this to the trash and then being able to immediately start synchro climbing. So that's just, again, the floor of what we're able to do. Now, other cards that we're playing to support that game plan, we are playing three copies of Beautiful Princess. So this is going to be able to summon our Paces if we need to get into our Deep Sea Coelacanths. If we want to, we can just go into a Lifeless Leafish and then, of course, begin our rotations with Shift, sending to the graveyard. So there's lots of different directions we can go, but Beautiful Princess is another fantastic startup card. We are also playing a single copy of Minai Ruka. Now, Minai Ruka is a kind of obscure card. Whenever a Water Monster's effect is activated on a quick effect, you can special summon this card from your hand. You can, while this card is face-up, banish a face-up fish, sea serpent, or aqua-type monster to target a face-up card on the field and negate its effects until the end of the turn. This is helpful because it's actually a way of kind of negating or getting over potential floodgates. It can help get over a lot of cards that could be problematic. There are plenty of things that, of course, can shut down your synchro plays. There can be all sorts of floodgates that can be problematic for your gameplay. So just having it, again, as a one-of where you can use that effect in a pinch very, very nice to have. It's kind of nice to have when you need it. Now, all of the other fish bodies we're playing do revolve around, of course, the big man himself, Super Ancient Deep Sea King Coelacanth. So, once per turn, you can discard any card to special summon as many level 4 or lower fish monsters as possible from your deck, but they cannot declare an attack and their effects are negated. 
Whenever a card or effect is activated that targets this card on the field, you can tribute one other fish monster, negate that effect, and if you do, destroy that card. So this is, again, one of our biggest combo enablers. We can summon easily four bodies to the field. I'm going to put a, a full combo guide for Deep Sea King in my particular favorite lines at the end of the video. Feel free to skip ahead if you're interested in knowing exactly the kind of route you can go with Coelacanth. But two other cards we are playing specifically for the Coelacanth line, we are playing Fishborg Launcher. Cannot be used as synchro material except for the synchro summon of a water synchro monster. If you have a monster in your graveyard other than Fishborg Launcher and all of them are water, you can special summon this card from your graveyard but banish it when it leaves the field. We are also playing a single copy of Gluttonous Reptolphin Grethus. Grethus lets you target one fish, sea serpent, or aqua type monster in your graveyard with an equal or lower level than the number of cards in your opponent's hand. Special summon it, but it cannot activate its effects this turn. If this card is sent to the graveyard as synchro material, you can make the synchro monster that used this card as material gain 200 attack and defense for each card currently in your opponent's hand. That extra little attack bonus can be pretty nice in a pinch, but this again is going to be a nice extender and part of the combo enablers that we're going to be getting off of our Coelacanth. Now the last fish monster we are playing is going to be two copies of Silent Angler. This card is a very easy Xyz material. It is basically just lets you summon itself from your hand for free as long as you control a water monster, but prevents you from playing other monsters from your hand for the rest of the turn. So there's a little bit of a limitation there, but as long as you can get another free body in play, this lets you go into some of your level four Xyz. Now, the last two cards that I'm playing are some spicy tech choices for you guys. First of all, we're playing two copies of Hop Ear Squadron. During your opponent's main phase, quick effect, you can target one face-up monster you control, special summon this card from your hand, and if you do, immediately after this effect resolves, synchro summon one synchro monster using only this card you control and that target. So basically, this is going to do the exact same job as our goatee tuners. However, we can use this from our hand, which means we do not have to commit that extra body to the board. Now, only some of our Synchro Monsters are going to be able to go into this. It cannot go into Great Beyond because it does require a Fish-type tuner, but that is okay. We have other level 10 Synchros that we are more than happy to create thanks to our Hoppier Squadron. But the final card, the spicy tech choice that we're playing in our monster slots, is two copies of Nemesis Corridor. Now, you already know exactly what this card is in here for. It, of course, lets us go into Thunder Dragon Colossus, but it slots perfectly into the Goatee archetype, not only being a level 4 body that we can use for Synchro plays, but, of course, it's returning a banished card back into our deck again, and this deck likes to banish a lot of cards. There are plenty of cards that may end up in the banished zone that we do not want there or want to recycle after their initial use. To being able to recycle those banished cards is already going to be a nice benefit, but of course, having a level 4 body and being able to use that card for synchro plays when we need to is fantastic as well. So, two copies of Nemesis Corridor are my particular spice choices, so we can have Thunder Dragon Colossus added to our end board after doing some other ludicrous things. So, this for spell cards, we are of course still playing our single copy of 1 for 1. This will let us summon either Beautiful Princess, our Fishborg Launcher, or our Effect Veiler. So it'll give us access to our tuners if we'd need to, or of course any of our fish monsters through Beautiful Tuneful Princess. And our last card we are playing in the main deck is the Most Distant Deepest Depths, which already an awesome name. And again, just a perfect demonstration of how beautiful this archetype truly is aesthetically. While you control a fish synchro monster, this card cannot be destroyed or banished by card effects. You can only use each of the following effects of the most distant deepest depths once per turn. You can banish a fish monster from your hand or graveyard, add one goaty monster from your deck to your hand. If a fish monster is normal special summon to your field while this card is in your graveyard, you can target a fish monster you control, banish it, and if you do, add this card to your hand. So the primary thing that Deepest Depths does for us, again, is it another searcher to grab our Paces or any of our other valuable cards. It can banish fish monsters from the graveyard, which means it's going to be strict card advantage every single turn if we do it from there. And if you choose to add, for instance, our one copy of Ixeep from your deck to your hand, it will see that you just banished a fish monster and let you summon Ixeep immediately. So it is also just another free body. So I'm playing a single copy of the field spell. I really don't think you need more than this. You really just need the one copy. And it's always nice when you see it. It is definitely a cool card to be playing. That's going to do it for our main board. Let's go ahead and start moving into our extra deck. As I mentioned, we are playing our single copy of Thunder Dragon Colossus. Easily splashable. Now, a lot of people may be wondering why I'm not playing Abyss Shark, which is an instant Xyz. I'm choosing to play the Nemesis Corridors over the Abyss Sharks. So, since Abyss Shark kind of locks you into water monsters for the turn, 
I kind of felt like it was one or the other, and I've been playing Thunder Dragon Colossus because I think it's actually more impactful than the primary Xyz you're going to be going into, which is going to be Stealth Dragon. We're still playing Stealth Dragon, but I think Thunder Dragon Colossus is a little bit better, so I'm choosing to play Thunder Dragon Colossus in my personal list because why not? It's legal on Master Duel. Now, the first and most important Goaty Synchro monster we are playing is two copies of Arianpost, the Serpent of the Goaty. When this card is Synchro Summoned, you can banish a level 6 or lower fish monster from your deck. If this card is sent to the graveyard as Synchro Material, you can target one fish monster in your graveyard, banish that target, and add a fish monster with an equal or lower level from your deck to your hand. Now next up we have White Aura Monoceros, which I am playing a single copy of. When this card is Synchro Summoned, you can target a fish monster in your graveyard and special summon it, but it cannot attack for the turn. If this card you control is destroyed by your opponent's card and sent to the graveyard, you can banish a water monster from your graveyard to special summon it, and if you do, it is treated as a tuner. The recursion effect is okay. It's not really why it's there, but it's an extender. And again, combo section of the video. We are playing a single copy of White Aura Whale. White Aura Whale is one of our primary level 8s that we're going to be going into. We are playing two fish level 8 synchro monsters that we can make with our goatee tuner plays. When this card is synchro summoned, you can destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters. This is a when effect, so if you're going to be playing this card off of a goatee tuner monster, make sure you are using it on an empty stack or it will miss timing. This card can make up to two attacks on monsters during each battle phase, and if this card attacks a defense position monster in inflict piercing battle damage. And again, much like White Aura Monoceros, if it would be destroyed, you can banish one other fish monster from your graveyard to special summon it back as a tuner. So White Aura Whale is going to be one of our two fish synchros. We are also playing a single copy of Ascan, the Bicorned Goaty. When this card is synchro summoned, target a fish monster you control and one card your opponent controls and banish them. When this card is banished, you can banish a fish monster from your graveyard to special summon it back. So this card's very easy to recur. If it's in your graveyard, you can banish it with any of your effects that do so to immediately banish another fish monster and bring it back. And of course, the primary use for its initial effect is targeting itself and an opponent's card, banishing them both, and then immediately bringing Ascan back. The last level eight that we're gonna be playing is a copy of Ad Emancipator Risen Dragite. This card is primarily just used for its negation effect, where as long as you have a water monster in your graveyard, quick effect once per turn, you can negate the activation of a spell or trap effect. So Dragite's pretty common. He's very, very powerful on this list, and we can make him pretty consistently. Moving up, we are playing a single level 9, which is going to be Ravenous Crocodragon Arkethis. Gains 500 attack for every card in your hand. Then you can activate each of the following effects of Crocodragon Arkethis once per turn. When this card is synchro summoned, draw cards equal to the number of non-tuners used for its summon. And on a quick effect, you can discard two cards to target one card on the field and destroy it. We are playing a single copy of Barone the Floor. Barone really doesn't need much of an introduction. She is a very common generic level 10 staple. And of course, since we're making level 10s, we are playing her. We are playing a single copy of Sword Soul Supreme Sovereign Cheng Ying. Cheng Ying is, of course, excellent in the Goaty archetype, which is going to be banishing cards as it is, which lets you activate his effect pretty consistently. We are playing a single copy of Ice Jade Gymir Igerine. Now, this may not be quite as common of a card, so we'll go over what this card actually does. Quick effect, you can activate this effect to make face-up monsters you control unable to be destroyed or banished by your opponent's card effects for the rest of this turn. Then, if you activated this effect in response to your opponent's card or act effect activation, and your opponent has a card with that name on their field or in their graveyard, you can banish those cards. So it's nice removal and protection. Additionally, if a card is banished by your opponent's card effect while this card is in your graveyard, you can then special summon this card, so it has some recursion. So, pretty nice and pretty interesting body. Some decks simply may not have outs to this card. But the big piece de resistance for our Goaty archetype is, of course, the big Goaty boss monster, Goaty of the Deep Beyond. So Goaty of the Deep Beyond requires a fish tuner, so you can really only make it with those particular tuners, our Goaty tuners or fish fork launcher. The original attack of this card is 500 multiplied by your number of banished monsters. Very easy to get to 5,000 or more attack. If this card is synchro summoned during your opponent's turn, you can banish all cards on the field. During the standby phase of the next turn after the card was banished from the monster zone, special summon this banished card. So this is one effect that this particular card has that is different from its other Goaty support, which is it is only going to recur itself if it's banished from the field. So that is one of the places where we can really use the extra value and utility from Snopios, for instance, where if you have a Goaty of the Deep Beyond in play that has already returned, it's not going to instantly banish itself again. But if you have Snopios, you can target your Goaty of the Deep Beyond to make sure that any time it would leave next, it will automatically banish and come back again. So there's ways to recur Goaty of the Deep Beyond beyond that, but of course the big play that it's going to have is that when you are able to sync climb into it on your opponent's turn, you can instantly banish all of your opponent's cards, including itself. 
As I mentioned, this is going to clear your field, which means if they are able to play through this, you can immediately play a potential Nibiru and then wipe anything additional they were able to create. But that is pretty much going to be, a, yeah, Go to the Deep Beyond is a very powerful card, and if you are able to make it consistently, it is very, very scary. The final synchro we're going to be playing is a single copy of Psychic and Punisher. Since we are playing a couple of level 1 tuners, um, this is basically something that we can do with our level 10 bodies once we're finished with them, or if we need the extra utility that Psychic and Punisher provides. It's a nice curve top end, and you can also, just coincidentally, create this if you happen to have Crocodragon Arkethis in one of your level 2 Goaty tuners, so they're able to make it that way as well. Lastly, we are going to be playing two level 4 Xyz monsters. We're playing a copy of Abyss Dweller for the insane value that Abyss Dweller is able to provide, as well as a single copy of Stealth Kragen for that extra removal interaction that you can use on both turns. So that is pretty much going to be it for the primary deck profile that we're going to be doing today. With that, we're going to go ahead and transition over into our Godi combo guide. We're going to talk a little bit about the primary Godi combos that the deck is looking to make, as well as talking about specifically the Super Ancient Deep Sea King Coelacanth lines, which can be a little bit complicated. So we'll go ahead and talk about those as well. All right, so let's talk about Godi combos. We've already talked about the primary combo, which involves Lifeless Leafish. Let's say that we have a starting hand of Paces and Leafish itself. The first thing we want to do is Normal Summon our Paces. By activating its effect, we can banish Paces from the field to summon Lifeless Leafish. Leafish's effect will then activate, letting us send Shift to the graveyard. Banish Shift from your graveyard using its effect to give plus 500 attack to our Leafish, and we can already pass our turn. During the opponent's standby phase, both Shift and Paces will return to our fields and have their abilities ready to use during the main phase, letting us Synchro Summon. The first thing you're going to want to do when you're ready to make your first response is activate the effect of Paces. Paces' effect will let us Synchro Summon with our Lifeless Leafish into Arianpos. From here, we want to use Arianpos' effect to banish Zep from our deck. When Zep is banished, it will immediately summon itself to the field, allowing us to Synchro Summon with Arianpos straight into our level 8s. Depending on the timing and circumstances, we can either go into Ascan the Bicorned Goaty, or White or a Whale. When Arianpos is sent to the graveyard, you're able to banish, of course, a fish monster from your graveyard to add one to your hand. I generally prefer to banish Arianpos and add a Snopios from the deck to the hand so we have additional forms of interaction. From here, whenever we're ready, we can activate Shif, which can then Synchro Summon with our Ascan in order to summon Goaty of the Deep Beyond. This, of course, will then activate Goaty of the Deep Beyond's effect, banishing our opponent's entire field. All right, let's go ahead and transition into talking about Deep Sea King Coelacanth. We're able to summon Deep Sea King Coelacanth as long as we have the ability to access Paces. We can do this either by having one of our three copies of Paces, three copies of Butuniful Princess, we can do it with our single copy of One for One, or our single copy of Deepest Darkest Depths, all of which will allow us to actually tutor out the Paces to our hand or to our field. So traditionally, let's say for simplicity's sake, we're starting with our Paces and Coelacanth in hand. Normal Summon Paces, activate its effect, and summon the Coelacanth to the field. You want to discard any card from your hand as long as it's not a hand trap that is a non-water monster. This will be important later. The four monsters you want to summon out with Coelacanth are Fishborg Launcher, Reptolphin Grethus, and two level fours, one of which should be Lifeless Leafish, the other can be any of the other three options available. The first thing we're going to do is use Reptolphin Grethus to Synchro Summon with one of our level fours. This will allow us to Synchro Summon out White Aura Monoceros. We're going to want to put Monoceros up in our extra monster zone, so we can use its effect on Summon to bring back Reptolphin Grethus. Grethus is now free to use its effect, which, as long as your opponent has a full 5 cards in hand, or at least 4, will then be able to summon back immediately the level 4 that we used, netting us a level 7 synchro without losing any of our board presence. The next thing we're going to do is use Fishborg Launcher and both of our level 4s to go into Crocodragon Arkethis. This will allow us to immediately draw 2 cards back, replacing 2 of the cards that we have lost with our combo up to this point. Since we should only have water monsters in our graveyard, now we can resummon Fishborg Launcher back to the field. Using Fishborg Launcher and either of our level 7s, we can now use them to go into our level 8 Arisen Dragite. Dragite is going to give us some extra interaction on the opponent's turn, just in case they have any spell or traps that are going to be vital to their game plan. Lastly, we have a level 7 and a level 3 tuner remaining, which means we can also go into a level 10 Synchro Monster. Barone, Swordsoul Grandmaster, and Ice Jade are definitely going to be worthwhile 10s that we can finish on. 
Once we finish with the rest of our combo, we'll also have our lifeless leaf fish in our graveyard, which we can banish to target three of the other fish monsters we've sent to draw an additional card. Which means not only have we created this entire board stacked with interaction for the opponent's turn, we haven't lost a single card of advantage and have drawn back to our full five again. This is just one of the synchro lines that we can use to demonstrate the absolute sheer power of Deep Sea King Coelacanth, of course hoping that the opponent doesn't have interaction to stop us at the start of the combo. But uh, yeah, that's going to about do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth Godi deck profile for Master Duel and Yu-Gi-Oh! If you guys enjoy this content, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment down below. There are a lot of fun things you can do with this deck, and lots of really spicy tech options that you can try out. So if you have any things that you've been playing that have been working really well, feel free to let me know. I'm always looking for ways to tr uh, change this deck up and try different options. I'm an avid herpetologist. I hope you all have a great rest of your evening, and I will see you all next time.